This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for December 28th, 2021. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network feed or our own podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you'd like to donate to the show, click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site. That's where you could set up a one time a recurring donation. If you just click the red box that says sponsor this podcast, no obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Iron Mike Spears, joined alongside our other host, Case Slow. And Case, let's just get into it. What a 72 hours has it been in Dragon Gate? It's been wild, but most importantly, how are you doing? How are your holidays? I feel like I need to make a notes app apology off the bat because you and I talked a big game last week about how if Kai somehow walked away from Fukuoka with the Open the Dreamgate Championship, we were going to do breaking news audio, two men that do audio production for a living, that didn't bring their recording equipment home with them for the holidays. We were going to go laptop mics. We were going to have this podcast pumped out, and then we didn't do it. But uh, it, it has been uh, a very newsworthy and shocking and intriguing three days in Dragon Gate. As for me, I had a, uh, I had a lovely Christmas in the low territory of Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, what, what what can I say? I am the proud owner of a new PlayStation 5. It's hard to complain when you have that good of a Christmas. Mike, I hope everything went well for you at the Spears compound. You know, uh, it, it, it was a kind of quiet christmas it was a little smaller than usual uh you know the only thing that really is happening is the budding cold war between pudge and my parents dog uh got to see some family i haven't seen in a while got a pair of hiking sticks which is really dope big hiker mike spears that that's <laughs> that that's not a brand that's just something i do like no that, that's, that's a shoot that that's not a gimmick that's real life brother <laughs> yeah yeah that's real life uh the only thing that, that I complain about is the state of the South Carolina interstate system where they refuse to widen uh, interstates. Like, j- just we talked a lot about this a little bit before I hit record case. But so I take, I, I'm not going to give up the entire things. You know, I, I, I believe uh, church and state, like, there are certain things that y'all don't want to know about about me, and there are certain things I'd rather not talk about. But, uh, the, there is, this, by the way, uh, this is such a fascinating uh, preview for a story that I believe is about an interstate. Yes, Go ahead. Yes. I, th- I have no idea where this is going now. So uh, as I traveled to the Spear Southern Compound in Southern Florida, I have to take the uh, Eisenhower Interstate System. And the thing about that is South Carolina has been rated by multiple polls as the worst state in the nation to talk about. Shut up, uh, Washington, D.C. Shut up, Atlanta. I don't care. But the thing is, is that there is a stretch of I-95, which runs from like Savannah upwards through Florence and then into uh, Raleigh, Durham, as you leave the state. But South Carolina refuses to widen it. So it's only four lanes, so two on each side. And I was stuck, just no, no rack, no like lane sh- lane shut down it was just congested for over an hour and a half and that was me going northbound yesterday so 
I sat in a car for 12 hours yesterday. And you know what? You know, it was a great thing to come to after having that and a nice thing to watch and cheer me up. It was Final Gate and it was today's Kobe Sambo Hall show. But I have, I believe in two things in politics now. I'm becoming, the, these are the two things I, tr- uh, other than like the obvious, the two things I truly care about. Number one, we need to stop having noises on television that wake up pets and freak them out. Like, no more doorbells, no more dog barking, especially no more dog barking, and, and no more just like loud errant noises. The same thing as like uh, fireworks to me. We're going to outlaw fireworks as well. But number two, the South Carolina interstate system must have six lanes at least because it was just befuddling to me. So that was my holiday case. I am sorry to hear that you you started off by saying it was a pretty good holiday, but that sounds that sounds horrible. You did not have a Christmas ce- to celebrate, maybe like Kai to get into our first topic here, Mike Spears. Yeah, so we didn't do the emergency show, but you know, stuff happens. But uh, Kai is the new Open the Dream Gate champion after defeating Yamato at Final Gate twenty twenty one. It was on December 26th. It'll be up on the network until the second. Great attendance for Dragon Gate up year to year in Fukuoka. Kai defeated Yamato with the Meteo Impact Kai in 27 minutes. Yamato fails in his fourth defense. And Kai becomes the 34th Open the Dream Gate champion. And we get a nice moment to end Final Gate. Very reminiscent of 2011 with uh, Blood Warriors, with R.E.D., with nearly all the gold, just looking like that they are at in total control and nothing could possibly ever go wrong for R.E.D. But Kai case, Kai did it. That 1% chance I talked about last week, it came true. And Kai had, at least in my opinion, the second best match of Yamato's title ring outside of the Kota Minora match. I thought this was actually a whole lot of fun, and it showed a lot that I was really hoping for in this feud. I still think the feud overall was very underwhelming, but this one, like I like main event Kai, like Kai felt like something and it played into the better tendencies we saw from Yamato in May through July of this year. So this was my least favorite of the Yamato defenses. I thought the coach Menor match, that's, that's a borderline top 10 match of the year for me. Certainly one of the 10 best matches to take place in Dragon Gate this year. I thought the BB Hulk match, I was much higher on that than you. The the BB Hulk match to me, and that was a gate of destiny in early November, was chaotic and out of control. And up until that unfortunately botched finish, I, I was just blown away by how good that match was and what BB Hulk was able to produce. Because for as much as I like Hulk, especially at his peak, I did not think he had a 20-minute hard-hitting Dreamgate main event left in him. And he, he proved me wrong. I thought he and Yamato went out there and they killed it. For as poor of a build as the high-end versus high-end Yamato versus Ben K match had at Gate of Origin, the actual match itself I thought was terrific. And the finishing stretch showcased why Yamato can be as good as he is. It showed Ben K at his very best in sort of a no-nonsense singles capacity. Those two went out there and crushed it. It's not that I dislike the Kai match. I gave it three and three quarter stars. My written review is up at VoicesOfWrestling.com with my immediate thoughts. I I wrote that review at about 6.30 in the morning Eastern time. As soon as that bell rang, as soon as that match finished up, I went and wrote that review. Those are my immediate after the bell thoughts. I've had a few days to sit on it, so uh, perhaps my takes will differ a little bit. I've let them marinate a little bit more, but I, I, I really liked this match, and I think you... You hit on something that I think is going to be important as we discuss the possibilities of this Kai reign and what to expect going forward, is that this is a guy who has been in the promotion for three years now. There's a lot I want to talk about about Kai in terms of his position in the context of Dragon Gate, but the one thing that you can say about him despite how he was treated in Wrestle 1, despite the fact that he never got over to the level that All Japan desired, Kai in a vacuum is capable of having great singles matches, and he can certainly do that with this Dragon Gate roster. Yeah, and it's something where I, yet again, throwing roses at Jay for this, like talking about like Kai in the lead up here said, like, 
I've gone everywhere, and I've, de- and I've determined that Dragon Gate's the pinnacle of wrestling, and I need to prove that I'm the best wrestler in the world by winning the Dreamgate title. And just like the way that he worked in this match, it was very hard-hitting. It was a lot of... We got the Yamato Grapple Fest to start, but then we, we got stuff like a really sick clothesline on the apron from Kai, and it, it's something like where he did like this really nasty side headlock like 10 minutes into this match case that... I just went crazy for it just because it was a way that the camera work on this show, like they, they might've got like another floor cam that someone was getting angles. that we usually don't see in dragon gate programs that, but it was really like in the face and Yamato was bleeding from his lips and it just looked really sick as hell. And I guess like the, the reason why I like this a lot more than the Hulk match, which I felt like really fell apart towards the end. And that really took down my enjoyment or, Benke, where I know I'm kind of like divergent there, where I felt like it was the most soulless good Dreamgate match I've seen in a long time, was that this one really felt like it had like the stakes to it for as meandering and as frustrating as Kai and Yamato's feud has been. Like it kind of felt like what now that everything was serious now, now that everything was like buckled down, like yes, this match is not as good as the no ropes match. Like I think that's undebatable here. But I felt like that Kai kind of played into Yamato's strengths in the right way. And we got to see a version of main event Kai that makes me really fascinated about where this Dreamgate run will go. Like, I don't think this is going to be one of those runs that he's going to go into a Kobe world and drop it to someone. I think it's a perfect run for how Dragon Gate's uh, schedule starts off traditionally, where it's kind of slow up until really Memorial Gate and things kick into gear. But I think that he will be like a good person that like you'll be able to get some fresh matchups up top. And maybe I would not try some of the younger wrestlers like how they have really over the last few years, especially since COVID started. But I think that he's going to be someone that will be very interesting as Dreamgate champion will provide a different element that we haven't necessarily seen in a while. I want to talk about Kai as an entity and sort of his history and how we got to this point. But before we get to that, let's put this win, let's put this match in the context of Dragon Gate and the history of the Open the Dream Gate Championship. I think you and I can both agree, and we talked about this a little bit actually with the mask versus mask match at the start of this month and how that was Dream Gate or not one of the most shocking finishes in the history of this promotion with Dragon Daya getting unmasked in the turn with Shun Skywalker there. And there's a lot to talk about with Masquerade as we go along on this podcast. But you and I both agree that Yamato defeating Shingo Takagi and his first Dreamgate defense in the summer of 2013 is probably the single most shocking uh, finish in the history of this promotion. When it comes to other Dreamgate matches, I think in terms of shocking finishes, you have to look at Susumu Yokosuka defeating Shingo Takagi for the Dreamgate belt in February of 2016, and Naruki Doi defeating Binke for this belt at this event, Final Gate 2019. I would put y- uh, Yamato losing to Kai on this level because I really did not see this coming. I, di- I was stunned watching in the moment when Kai got the three count. I think it's one of the single most surprising Dreamgate changes that have ever happened. Do you agree or disagree with that take? I think I would put this in the top three. One of the ones that you left off that, you know, in retrospect, and especially in hindsight, especially since he's been away from the company for a long time, uh, Ricochet becoming the first Gaijin to become Open the Dreamgate champion at Champion Gate 2014 on May, on March 2nd, 2014 is the only other one I would add to the list there. But I would say that so Sumu one wasn't necessarily as shocking in my opinion as Shingo finally taking the head off of Shima after Shima's just monstrous run that like I, I feel like we can't impart how like monumental that run was like 15 title defenses no one else since then has more than seven just to give a sense of that and Shingo winning that like taking him out and then less just over a month later losing the belt like 33 days, like almost exactly one month later in his first offense at Corken Hall, not even at Oda State Gymnasium, and not even making it to Dangerous Gate. This was a Corken Hall show that he dropped the belt at. So I, I think it's either the 
uh, Masato Yoshino losing the belt to Ricochet in 2014, or it is Shingo's loss to Yamato in 2013. But I think this one ranks up with those three. I, I completely agree. This is a historic moment for the promotion. It is the first time a freelancer has won the belt as despite the fact, and we'll talk about how Kai has exclusively worked for Dragon Gate this year and since 2019, without a doubt, his home promotion has been Dragon Gate. He has worked a full-time schedule for this company, to my knowledge, and I, I was not corrected uh by anybody, but I, when I ask those questions, Kai is still considered a freelancer. He's the first freelancer to hold this title, the second person to not be affiliated with Dragon Gate and win this championship, with the first being Jushin Thunder Liger in 2007. There's a case you can be made that both Ricochet and Pac uh, did not belong to Dragon Gate, but when they worked Best of Super Juniors, they had a little Dragon Gate in parentheses next to them, so I consider them to be a full-time roster member, if that makes sense. I want to talk about Kai historically, because it's so easy. And I think you're going to see a lot of this. I've already seen a lot of this, a lot of bad Kai takes as the week progresses, because it's very, very easy to see him beating the figurehead of this promotion, the undoubted ace of Drangate in Yamato. It is very easy to see this result and to LOL Kai this situation. It's very easy to make a meme out of this result. And quite frankly, I think that is a horrible take. This is a guy who came in when the roster was so depleted, when the when the roster was so light in the summer of 2018. He and Hiroshi Yamato and Hiroshi Yamato came in. They started working dates in Cork and Hall, and as Yamato faded away, Kai slowly began picking up more and more Drangi dates again to a point where this has been his home promotion. And you can say, well, Maybe he only worked Drangate because they didn't want their guys wrestling in other promotions this year. Maybe that's why he didn't do All Japan. But he worked All Japan in 2020. A-10 and Masaki Mochizuki, they made uh, their second uh, their second home in pro wrestling Noah this year. Kai is a guy who, for better or worse, is a Dragon Gate guy through and through at this point. And I talked about this in my written review of, on a real-life level, it seems like Kai loves this promotion. We joked during the Generational Warfare last year that in terms of the Dragon Gate Generation unit, Kai seemed most hell-bent on defending their honor, and he was the one guy that wasn't a trueborn. But when it came to defending the Dragon Gate legacy, Kai seemed all about it. And there was something that I, I, I liked about this build, and there wasn't a ton from November to December that I liked about Yamato versus Kai in the lead-up to this match. But the one thing that Kai repeatedly hit on, and I really liked this point, was that he talked about how the Open the Dreamgate Championship is the most important belt in wrestling, and therefore, the man who holds that title is the best wrestler in the world. And I think that is really going to go a long way, at least for me, in terms of accepting this reign and possibly even being a fan of what Kai does in the future, because it wasn't this Naito white belt apathy that I think we see so many heels play up in wrestling today, where they are winning a title in spite of themselves. When they don't really want this belt, they just want to make sure that their enemy doesn't have this belt. No, Kai was dead set on winning the Open the Dreamgate Championship. His character made it clear that this was a big deal to him, and I think that came across in this match. I think that is just a, a terrific moment and a nice sprinkle of booking from Dragon Gate. Yeah, and it's something that they've already kind of playing off of this, you know? Uh, not to get into Kobe Sambo Hall too much, but we'll get into it more in depth later on in the show. He made a big point of saying, I'm the champion here, and treating this like an important thing. Like, of course, Yamato, people in Dragon Gate don't really treat the Dream Gate as not as an unimportant thing. Like, I can't think of the last time there was a very just, uh, I don't want to hammer down on Tetsuya Naito as Intercontinental Champion. But we, no, they're, they're no, really... if there is a safe space to do that, it is this podcast. Go ahead, Mike Spears. Yeah, no, th there's no one that's completely apathetic about the Dream Gate title in Dragon Gate. That's been very clear, I at least since my beginning to watch Dragon Gate in 2006. So for 15 years that I've avidly fallen this following this promotion, like the most like the most like besmirching the title happened when Mad Blanky had all the stuff against BB Hulk and they tried to get Mondai Ryu to be declared champion during this. And it's like, oh yeah, Mondai Ryu could do this there. Then Nuriki Doi insisted that he was champion after winning, being the last person in, in a gauntlet match. Like the Dreamgate title 
at least within this promotion. And I think other promotions have done a very good job of this recently, like AEW with their men's world title. But Kai made a very big point here of saying, I am the Dreamgate champion. Why am I doing this here? And that goes on along the point he made making earlier. That's like, I view Dragon Gate as the best wrestling in the world. And that means that whoever holds the open, the Dreamgate champion is the best wrestler in the world. And I want to win this belt to become the best wrestler in the world because I believe I am that. And that is going to be such a interesting way to start off a title run. And it's something that at least as they closed out 2021, I feel like that they did a exceptional job here. And I think it's something that with Yamato, hey, uh, we, we don't, I, oh, the, the, the dead horse has been beaten so much by us case, but it, well, we do need to kind of close out his run here. Like he was the safe hand Dragon Gate, as we've talked about since, August 1st, really since the whole specter of the double Kobe World Cannon Hall shows was announced, where like Yamato is the safe hand. They like going to the safe hand in times of uncertainty. He got them through the uncertainty. Business has rebounded since the retirement of Masato Yoshino. Uh, the attendance here was up a significant portion from last year when you consider last year had one of the best matches in the promotion's history. And the promotions is doing as well. They're growing, as we've talked about over the last few months, and their expansions to Tohoku and how they treat Nagoya. So this is a company that is not standing still, has not stood still for the last two years during COVID. And they had Yamato in the captain seat for a while, got them through the hot season. And now we will enter 2022 with Kai as champion. And I think that that's, kind of best for both parties here i still have mixed feelings on how much weight i want to put into any sort of covid era attendance but you do raise a good point that we are now looking at because unfortunately because covid has lasted as long as it has we are seeing objective growth with dragon gate within covid capacity settings and i don't know this is a genuine i don't know not a hypothetical or rather a rhetorical one I don't know if any other promotion in Japan can say that, but we are seeing clear growth within this promotion. And I have maintained for as big of a critic as I have been of Yamato, of his open the Dreamgate run and of high end as a unit in which he is the leader of him getting the Dreamgate title on August 1st was undoubtedly the correct decision. It was the most boring decision they could have made, but it was the correct decision. They got him. They uh, uh, like you said, Mike, they got through this hot period and here we are now entering a new year with just a world of possibilities at stake. There's a few other things in terms of Kai that I do want to mention before we move on, but just to to finalize this Yamato topic, I want to ask you the question because this was Yamato's fifth reign as Open the Dreamgate champion. That was a record-breaking reign. No one had held the belt more than four times. Yamato, at 40 years old, gets his fifth run with the top belt and the promotion. He talked a lot about in the build up to winning that title and then in the uh, actual title reign about how seeing the success that Shingo had had in New Japan and that Akira Tozawa had had in the WWE had made him, had inspired him to have one more run with this title before the new generation overtook him. And I assumed whenever this Yamato run was going to end, and I certainly did not expect it to be at Final Gate, I assumed that that loss would come by way of somebody under 30 years old, under 35 years old at the very least. Instead, it goes to Kai, who is much older than that. I don't necessarily have an issue with that, but I do want to ask you the question. For whoever wins this title next, who is ever next in line after Kai, do you think the rub of beating a heel Kai is equal to the rub of beating the undisputed ace, babyface Yamato for the Open the Dreamgate title? No, and I think that takes a lot of people out of play for next Dreamgate champion. Like, and it's no slight against Kai. I mean, Yamato's the guy. I think Yamato will probably still have one more run before he really dials it back. But it, it it's something that you you not you do not necessarily like see this as a big passing the baton. Whoever takes the belt from 
Kai. Unless Kai somehow decides to have 16 defenses and runs with the title for two years. Okay? It's like that's the only way that I could see this being as big as someone winning the belt for the first time in like the generational shift they propose as Yam- as winning it from Yamato. Like it's just it changes things. And I think that other people come into play here as potential next champions. Maybe we don't have uh, someone becoming the youngest ever Grand Slam champion off of Kai, but I think that it does maybe p- potentially, given other things that have announced been announced, we might be able to see some of the recent champions that did not get a full capacity run are now back in play where they wouldn't be back in play if Yamato was going to be the one losing the belt to them, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I think Kai winning this belt here opens up the Dream Gate scene a lot because my biggest complaint about Yamato's title run was outside of Coach Minora, which is the first match they burned off, and outside of a possible Aita match, which I think is still the biggest match that this promotion has in their back pocket that they've run once in 2013 and then once in 2020 in an empty arena. I I didn't see any logical challengers lined up for Yamato because it, it, it we were under the assumption that this Kai feud was over and that their no ropes match in July was going to be the blow off for that feud, which means we had that awkward BB Hulk uh, challenge where to Hulk's discredit, like I just talked about with Kai, how he put over the Dreamgate so much, Hulk fought tooth and nail to not challenge for the Dreamgate belt and that that match was eventually made. And then the Ben K match, which look, it was a great match, but the build to that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. It was a real rare lapse in booking IQ from the Dragon Gate team. I was really disappointed in how that match came to be, even if the match was good. Everything about the build of this Kai match, again, is the culmination of a three-year story. Even if I think personally Yamato and Kai just don't have good chemistry and I'm sick of seeing them wrestle, the build here made sense, and Kai with the belt really opens up the roster to anybody that isn't on RED right now as a viable challenger, and I think that's really exciting. And I, and I think Kai can really have great matches with nearly anyone on the roster because the beautiful thing with him is I think him being positioned in this promotion as a singles champion is actually going to get the best out of Kai because as I look at my match of the year tracking list from 20, 2019 to now, there's a lot of Kai in Dragon Gate, but the one specific thing that I notice is this is not a guy like a Shun Skywalker or a Coach Minora or an Ata or an SB Kento or Hyo, Kai is not someone that really kills it in multi-man matches. His best output in this promotion is either in two-on-two tags or it is in singles matches. And I think him being put in a position where he can now have, as we talk about, you know, the Dreamgate almost has its own style, to be able to go out there and have a pretty traditionally structured 20-minute singles match, I think is going to do Kai a lot of good because... For the most part, there's never been a question of if this guy is a good wrestler or not. Unfortunately, and partially it's because he's been paired at the hip to Keiji Muto, the single most destructive force in pro wrestling's 21st century for so long, Kai has been made to look like a geek time after time after time. And I saw some people, and I, I saw this take multiple times, and I really think it's the worst possible take you can have for this a- a- out of the Streamgate match, is that people were comparing this to Muto beating Goshi Ozaki last February for the GHC belt. And I, I that is just factually incorrect. That is ridiculous to think, given that Kai has had three years on this roster. He's, he's wrestled for the Twin Gate belt. He's wrestled for the Triangle Gate belts. He has clearly implemented himself into this promotion and into this house style. This is not an outsider coming in and winning a belt. This is a a, a very quality heel wrestler defeating his opponent in a long-term story for the biggest title in the promotion. Now, this feud did not really land with me, or else I would be waxing poetically about Drangate's long-term storytelling. Unfortunately, it didn't hit that high point for me. But Kai is not Muto. Uh, the, the, the Muto comparison is if when Ultimo came back in 2019, if Ultimo came back, pinned Shun Skywalker, submitted Ata, and then beat Ben K flat in the middle of the ring and ended his title right? that would be the Muto equivalent Kai is a guy on the roster who has earned this title shot. More power to him. I wish him the best in the Streamgate run. Yeah, and, and I think that just like I, I luckily because when 
when when Mike's on vacation, the phone usually is off other than funny things, and I did not see a lot of these takes on the 26th. That's just people who obviously just don't follow the promotion and are just trying to go, LOL, that's funny. But as you just properly laid out, like this made sense. It was something that we didn't expect. But, you know, I think that it's going to do a lot of good for both guys. I think Yamato, uh, his time at the stern, you know, his time up in the bridge, really piloting the uh, the the ship Dragon Gate through some choppy waters. He served his time, and now we can get back to, you know, doing whatever Yamato does. I mean, doing photos and fan service, you know, all of that. And now we can kind of see what's going to happen with Kai as Dreamgate champion as we move into 2022. Uh, you know, that, that's been- the other thing. I want to make one final point here. The, regardless of what you think about Kai, and I do think there's a lot of data takes, a lot of people with bad takes that aren't super plugged into this promotion that maybe don't realize the way he's evolved as a wrestler. If you follow this promotion on, on any sort of close basis, if you've been watching since August 1st, this should be a joyous occasion because the Open the Dreamgate title is now off of Yamato. And for as much as I respect him as a wrestler, for as good as his reign bell to bell was, I think the Dreamgate scene is about to cause me uh, a much fewer headaches. I think this is going to be an ultimate plus in the main event scene because it wore on me. I really hated this Yamato championship reign. Did I expect the belt to go to Kai? No, I did not. That brings its own set of problems, but the belt is off of Yamato and that is a joyous celebration for me. Yeah, and I think we we as we get into talking about Yamato's post uh, Dreamgate run, and as we've seen like his first match of that, it feels like the weight's off his shoulders. And I think that ultimately, you know, it's a heavy belt. You know, I mean, I don't know if it's fifteen pounds or twenty pounds, but you know, that's a lot of weight on an ace's shoulders. And maybe he'll find some time to design a new pasta sauce. You know, I mean, he's made of a lot of interest, case low. Yeah, he, he, it, it's good that he could you know diversify that. The the unfortunate thing is, I don't know what's next in Yamato's path. I would assume he's going to either team with Dragon Kid or team with Kagatora, and we're going to get a Twin Gate challenge with him at some point within the first half of 2022. The most interesting thing he could do, in my opinion, is have a longstanding feud with Kaisuke Akuda, but they are in the same unit, so I don't know how they're going to get to that. But I think about their King of Gate match from this past year on Fukuoka, I think about that match quite a bit because that is really my ideal version of Yamato. And it's one of the few guys on the roster where it feels like Akuda can be Akuda against him because he can go to the mat and he can grapple with him to such an extreme degree. And we're not going to be able to get that at least in the immediate future. So I don't know what's next for Yamato. I really have no feel for it. You almost just wish this guy could go to Mexico for four or five months and just get away from this promotion for a little bit and then come back with a fresh coat of paint. But that's obviously not happening for a number of reasons. So we'll see what happens with him. I have no feel for it. But the Dreamgate belt is off of him, which makes me happy. And we head into 2022 with Kai as Dragon Gates open the Dreamgate champion. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see how all of this plays out. Uh, Moving down the card, the other title match on free on Final Gate, I almost called it Freedom Gate. It's been a while since we talked about Open the Void. <laughs> we talked about the Dragon Gate USA case, so I don't know what just made me pop in. I mean, he was an Open the Freedom Gate champion, so maybe that was it. But the next one was for the Open the Twin Gate Championships. It was the new era, Doi Yoshi, Naruki Doi, and Takashi Yoshida of the unnamed. I don't even know if Yoshida is a part of it, but Naruki Doi's uh, International House of Hot Boys. I'm just going to say that they're a part of that. We'll, we'll see how that plays out in January. They were they had their first defense against R.E.D., the team of S.B. Kento and Hio. When this match was made, it was S.B. Kento and Hio trying to become double champions. Hio, of course, dropped the triangle gate and a bad move agreeing to someone having a psychological breaks crazy ideas. But still, it was them going up against this open the twin gate team in their first offense. It was a new champions, two new champions and two title matches at Final Gate 2021 as Doi Yoshi failed in their first offense. The RED team becomes the 55th open the twin gate champions as Hio pins uh, Takashi Yoshida and the Neko Damashi 
which is not what I would knew what the name was called, but that's very, very cute because Neko is Japanese for cat. And we've talked about Hio being the big cat before. He got that on Takashi Yoshida in 13 minutes and 15 seconds. But as is a lot of the times with matches involving him, the story of this match is SB Kento. Uh, he came down lame on a suplex reversal, rolled to the outside like four minutes in the match, was really not involved in it whatsoever other than really the closing stretch and once uh, tripping up the champion's legs. Obviously was limping all the way throughout this match. Had a very light night in Kobe two days later. I know, Case, you've been doing a little bit of uh, asking around about this. And uh, SB Kento wakes up with his knee. I have a scoop. That is correct, Mike Spears. I talked to somebody close to the situation who would know. And I will read you the message verbatim. They said, Kento wasn't hurt during the match. He was hurt going into it. And they were just working around the injury. It's not a serious injury from what I hear, end quote, which is tremendous news because I, given the year that Drangate has had with the hip hop Kakuta injury, with the Masada Yoshino injury at the end of 2020 that bled into this calendar year, with Shun Skywalker going through an ankle injury the day before a dangerous gate, I feared for the worst. But given what I was told by someone close to the situation and the fact that he was working on the Kobe Sambo Hall show, even if it was a very, very light workload, as we'll talk about in a little bit, the fact that he was on that show, I'm not worried. He has a few weeks to rest up before the start of the year. I would expect him to be fine when uh, Drangit kicks off 2022 in Kyoto and Osaka. Yeah, that's the advantage of Dragon Gate having a slow January. He might not work those shows, but that's not an issue, really. I mean, I did, Case did not brief me on this ahead of time so my natural reaction is that's awesome you know i mean it is not good that he got hurt of course but you know the fact that it's not serious and at least was able to do to work before you know bowing out and was able to show up the next night and they didn't just take him off all the shows and and said that he was hurt i think that's a very promising thing uh you know, I mean, if you're talking about the MVP of Dragon Gate in 2021, and we'll we'll probably have a more in-depth best of 2021 episode during the break. But when you're going to talk about that sort of stuff, yeah, Shun Skywalker probably is the MVP, or at least most outstanding. But SB Kento would have to be in the running, or at least in your top three votes there. And I'm glad to hear that. Uh, just this match was not good because of losing a member of the match partway through for obvious reasons. I do have to say that given the circumstances, uh, Hio being put into the that situation, I felt like that he did strong work there. I feel like everyone worked around it, and they got through it. And to a way that I was like, you know what? All things considered, this was fine. This could have gone a whole lot worse, as we've seen uh, with title matches in this building. This could have gone a whole lot worse, and, you know, they got through it, and I mean, if they if this injury, as you reporting case, happened before this match, then if they were not confident in his knee, they would have not have changed the belts here. So I think that that tells us a lot right there as well. Yeah, the the good news is with the way the schedule is laid out, even if he misses the first few shows of the year, January eighth in Kyoto, January 9th in Osaka. Let's even say he misses the two Cork and Hall shows on the 12th and the 13th. This is a guy who realistically, for the status quo to continue, he doesn't really have to be back until February 23rd, Memorial Gate in Wakayama. If for some reason there's an injury that derails him and he would be off that show, then it would be cause for concern. But he's got a few weeks before the new year, and then even then, he's got another few weeks before the first big show where I would expect him to defend one of those two titles that he now holds. So it doesn't seem like it's a big deal. I'm not worried about it. I would expect everything to go con- uh, as planned going forward. Yeah, and I have to say, the little bit of Hyo and SBK teamwork that we saw before, obviously, SBK bowed out, They've got chemistry. They, they have something going on here. So I think that that's going to be pretty exciting. Maybe with Doyoshi dropping the belts, this maybe means that uh, Takashi Yoshida is not a hot boy and he will not be joining the International House of Hot Boys in the new year. But uh, 
yeah, I mean, there's really not much to say about this other, other than what you reported. And just it'll be interesting to see how long they kind of if they decide to hold him on the shelf past the eighth. And, you know, I, I did not I forgot the Memorial Gate came before uh, Champion Gate. So when I said earlier that this that the year really starts up with Memorial Gate, I was thinking about the March Memorial Gate, not the February one. So really, I mean, it's. You know, I would say best case scenario for SBK. I mean, hopefully they get it checked out and hopefully it confirms what we've been hearing. It happened at the right time of the year for sure. As for Doi and Yoshi, you know, we've we've talked about them quite a bit. We're both very excited about Naruki Doi's next step. I do wonder, and I know this reference will go over your head because you once butchered a reference to this show on this very podcast. I do wonder if Doi and Yoshida have a Drake and Josh like situation going for them where Doi is clearly Drake, he is the hot one, but by proxy, Takashi Yoshida, uh, the Josh of this situation, is included in all of Doi's hijinks. I, I would I would guess those two will be teaming as we head into the new year, but we'll, we, we will see, because, look, I, I love him, but on the surface, Takashi Yoshida, I don't think qualifies as one of Naruki Doi's hot boys. Yeah, especially considering someone that we'll talk about later that I think very much qualifies as a hot boy and might become the first person in the future class to get into a full unit here. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they do. Like, I feel like that the two of them had the charm and the chemistry and, you know, the stuff that of course is not going to be speed muscle, but I felt like that it was a good time at the very least. And I would be a little bummed at if they, if that was it for them for that there. Uh, do you have any other thoughts? I mean, there's really not much to talk about this like, other than that. Uh, should we move on to the three-way? Please. All right. Traditional Dragon System three-way six-man tag team match where both where there's two falls, and after each one person on your team takes the fall, that means your team is eliminated. The teams were Natural Vibes versus High End versus R.E.D., Natural Vibes, KZ, Big Boss, Shimizu, I nailed it this time, Case. I kept on getting tripped up by the big before, but not anymore. Uh, Dragon Kid, Keisuke Akuda, and Binke of High End. And then R.E.D. I would call this R.E.D. top team at this point, even though that Kai is champion now. Maybe I need to change that thought process. But at least at the time, it was the R.E.D. top team of Eita, BB Hulk, and Kaito Ishida. Natural Vibes won. The two falls that happened in the match were Hulk penning Keisuke Akuda with a first flash, and then Shimizu. Big Bross pressing Kaido Ishida after giving him the shot put slam out of the ankle lock. And I just got to say this. I love this match. I thought that there's one match I would call a little bit better than this on the show. But this felt every bit of a classic Dragon System three way to me. Yeah, this is why I love this promotion. It's this match and the match that preceded it for two totally separate reasons. You know, we'll talk about Shun Skywalker versus versus Coach Minoru in a second and how that was this really story-heavy match that I thought was executed to perfection and really harkened back to an old-school style of match with so much stuff they did. This nine-man tag was wrestling from the future. This is what people expect when they think Drangate. This was next level. This is why I think they have the best roster in the world. And this was a, a rare match of this style where all nine guys really pulled their weight. I specifically liked little things that every guy did in this match. It was absolutely terrific. I can't recommend it enough. I mean, all nine guys really did contribute, but you know who I think was the glue in this match? Because there's always is a glue in the three or four way matches. I think it was Jackie Funky Kame who has turned in probably like if we're doing like a six month best of six months, he has a claim to be most outstanding in the last six months. I thought Jackie here was amazing. The Torbellino that Kame was gifted by Masao Yoshino, Kame's Torbellino into the crucifix pen is my new favorite high spot in wrestling. And we're talking about an era of this sport where Dante Martin is innovating every single week when there are guys on the Dragon Gate roster like Lastre and Dragon Daya who are pushing high flying to new heights. All of that is nothing compared to how hot and perfectly executed this Torbellino into the crucifix pen is. Kamei has done it a handful of times now and I lose my mind every single time he does it. He busted it out on Ata in this match 
And for a brief second, I really thought they were going to give Kame the pin over Ata. The, the, the first part of this match when High End was involved, look, I've been the biggest critic of High End there is. I thought they were all great here. I especially like that we seem to get some prolonged periods of Benke and Akuda doing double team moves together. But once High End got eliminated and this became Natural Vibes versus R.E.D., that in itself was almost a four-star match. I mean, these two teams turned it up a level that is incredible to think about given the wear and tear of this roster this year, the amount of ups and downs that some of these guys have had. Kame missed a few months at the beginning of the year with a really bad injury, and for him to end the year looking like a ring general only two years into his career, magnificent stuff. Yeah, you're just really starting to see it. Like, after he came back and was a little bit shaky, he really, really has turned it on. I, I would say leading up to SBK versus JFK 1, and ever since then, he's been really special. But, like, a- as you said, everyone had, like, s- just insane moments in this. KZ doing, like, a pinpoint elbow smash when Dragon Kid did a springboard was phenomenal. RED just being able to, like, to flow together in a way that's just so much fun, like, that you could see... And, and we saw it again in, in Kobe Sambo Hall two nights later. But R.E.D., like, like when you get, like, the top half of R.E.D. together, when, when they're in these matches, and, like, we were talking about it earlier in 2021 with Masquerade, but just in general, they have a flow in a heel unit that's just so cool, like, the way that they will do double teams or, like, assist each other in, mat- in moves. Like, I always think about people hip-tossing Hio into a senton. And we got to see that a lot as well. But, I mean, nothing in this match really illustrated as much as that as the finishing sequence where uh, Kaido Ishida had Jackie Kame in an ankle lock and he had him in it for a good long time until uh, Big Boss Shimizu got into the ring, picked up uh, Ishida out of the ankle lock, gave him a shot put slam, and then right after the near fall went for the uh, Big Boss press. And, you know, it's just, this is the good stuff. This is the, the kind of thing. Remember how a couple of years ago we were kind of going like we missed the three-way and four-way and they had a couple ones that weren't bad but they kind of fell apart in a little bit like the first fall would be like solid stuff and then the 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 second or third fall is they kind of would lose their way this was just hot fighting from start to finish there's two takeaways from this finishing stretch here one i desperately need a kaito ishida versus jackie funky kame singles match in 2022 i don't know if Kame is ready for a King of Gate yet, uh, not because he's not talented enough, but just given his size and his experience level, I don't see him being placed into that tournament this upcoming year, which means we have to get creative and we have to find a way to book Ishida versus Kame one-on-one in the new year. And also, if I were a betting man, and I am not, I am not a degenerate gambler, but hypothetically, if I was, I would have some money down on Big Boss Shimizu versus Kai headlining Memorial Gate in Wakayama 2022. I think that is going to be Kai's first defense, and I think it is going to be a great match. Yeah, those two guys have great singles chemistry, and the way that Shimizu has ended 2021, I think that he would be the clubhouse leader there. I think as a degenerate case, I would gladly put money on that, and I would say that that would be the odds-on favorite at this point. Shimizu was so good. I mean, I, I I have talked about it at length before. I've had to deal with a lot of people that I really like having really bad opinions on Shimizu over the past few years because they're thrown off by whatever. I don't know what that could be. They're thrown off by something. I don't know. I don't care. This guy is locked in right now. This natural vibes unit. I, I, I actually want to talk about this here. It's... It's such an interesting unit, and KZ was another guy who was just brilliant in this match. There's definitely that argument to be made that Natural Vibes 2.0 is a hindrance to KZ's growth. He's going back in time. He should be doing something bigger and better because eventually he's going to have to win the Dreamgate belt. But this incarnation of Natural Vibes is such a special unit. I mean, we talked about how Masquerade operates like a well-oiled machine. I think Masquerade, for my money, is now, given this fallout story that is far from completed, but one that I'm completely invested in, I think Masquerade's one of the best units this promotion's ever had. And I am starting to wonder just how far back in the pecking order this incarnation of Natural Vibes is. Because this 
is a unit with six guys that no matter what combination of them you throw at another team, no matter what setting they're in, they seem to play all of the right notes. They seem to have perfect chemistry with one another. And it is a unit that once again feels like a well-oiled machine to a point where for as much as I would like to listen to that argument about KZ that he should be doing something, he should be wearing different colors, he should be in a different unit. I don't think Natural Vibes hurts him at this point because Natural Vibes is just that good. Yeah, and I would also, again, bring up, there's a reason why Kame is in a unit with KZ and Ginky Horiguchi. He's going to be the future evolution of that. He is going to be the person that the more that KZ can rub off on him, the better. So, yeah, KZ should eventually have like the, the new run, the new look, maybe the heel turn, but... Not yet. He still ha- natural vibes works right now, and all six. So you get like different looks with whatever combination you get, and I find that very fascinating in, in a way that you don't see from Masquerade. Like Masquerade, you, in a lot of ways, they are a well-oiled machine, but they're a well-oiled machine that's on a train tracks. You know, what I mean, we've talked about Shun Skywalker being like this runaway freight train sometimes when he gets going and you can't stop the train when it when it breaks away. Natural vibes, you you have a completely different look. When you have someone like Shimizu and UT team each other, team with each other like they did a couple of weeks ago, you have a different look when it's Susumu and KZ and, and Ginky Horiguchi. You have a different look when you add Kamei to the mix. The six guys, like it, it's such a versatile unit. And uh, for as many questions as we had about the reunion, it's worked out in everyone's favor so far. Maybe, maybe UT is the one person where it's a little bit like. I would want to see more for UT, but that's also me being very high on UT. UT being one of my favorite wrestlers in the company right now, but it works, and I wouldn't want to shake it up right now. Well, it, you know, UT is constantly in the mix. He never really wins anything, and I think those big wins are going to come eventually, but he's, I, I consider him to be a featured player at this point. He is always in the mix. And and I think him and Kame are especially interesting to watch in this unit. I was talking to somebody earlier this week about Genki Horiguchi and just how much we love Genki and how with so many of the old guard going away or retiring or just being phased out of this promotion, there was something about Genki Horiguchi where I, I it happened earlier this year. Mike and I were recording a podcast uh, with Alan Forrell that you can listen to on Pro Wrestling Torch. We were talking about the greatest wrestlers in Drangate history, and Alan like caught me off guard. He went on this monologue about how whether it's the pre match dance routine or it's in ring or it's selling merchandise or it's just presenting Drangate as this company how Genki Horiguchi is always giving 110%. And it's not like tears were streaming down my face, but there was something about the way Alan uh, perfectly put all of this together where it it did make me emotional because this is something that I've invested a lot of my time and my life into. And he hit on exactly what I love about Drangate and about Horiguchi was just this effort that is put into everything. And as Drangate goes on in the immediate future, and we see guys like SPK and Kamei and Kakuta and the future classes, they start to get their first big wins and they start to tell their first stories and write their first chapters in these long-term stories that this promotion is able to do. We're looking at the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years. But what is going to keep this promotion alive going forward, it's not the great matches, it's not even the storytelling, it's the spirit that this promotion has that is so different from a New Japan or a NOAA or a DDT, and I think Horiguchi perfectly embodies that spirit, and whether they're doing it intentionally or not, I do not know, but I certainly get the impression watching UT and Kamei basically follow around Horiguchi and Susumu, which you can always see on their social media, it does not seem like an accident that those two young guys are following around those two veterans, and as we go forward another five years, another ten years and beyond, I get the impression that UT and Kamei are going to be the ones driving that spirit into the future. And and I really think that's a terrific thing. I know Natural Vibes has their detractors, and I think they're wrong, because I think this unit is so important in the present of Dragon Gate, but more importantly, I think we're going to look back at Natural Vibes 2.0 as one of the most influential units in and out of the ring that this promotion has ever seen. And talking about presents, Case, you know, Dragon Gate could give me a present. You know what that would be? (laughs) What's that, Mike? It would be if they would make this really sweet college 
crew neck sweater that they made, if they would put it up on the store, if they would make more of it, because UT and Kamei have been styling in this in this hoodie. This is Dragon Gate it has 1999 on it, like an old school collegiate sweater. I think it's the coolest piece of merch out in wrestling today. And that would be a great present to me if I could get that. American sized extra large. I am 6'2, Dragon Gate. I would be the tallest man on your roster. I will pay you guys to custom make one for me, but you're exactly right. This crew neck that they've been modeling on their social media is ridiculous. And I really, really want, uh, I, 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 this, this merchandise is a must cop, dare I say. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it's something that like, they could even do it in like unit colors. So you can get like a yellow and green with uh natural vibes colors. So you could do like the nice, like, heather gray with purple for masquerade but they might not do that considering masquerade not long for the world and then like black and red or red and black for red uh you could do white and gold for high end i, I don't know what the color of the nurky toys international house of hot boys will be but you do that as well Th- this is a big seller like if they go this this way it, it, there's something there's something they can't do like i read an article a couple of years ago not we have a lot to talk about but i'm just gonna do this one tangent real quick no please about, go ahead about how in japan and in thrift stores before like champion really became like a resurgent brand that like collegiate champion crew neck sweaters of just random colleges became some of the hottest items in japanese thrift stores like oklahoma university like it, like someone getting like an OU one of those was like one one of those hot things and the and the fact that Dragon Gate a couple of years later is playing upon that I think is it, it it's a great fashion move for one but it's something that at least from my understanding from that article I read that would be very good for the fan base and I think that's something that you know the public would find very appealing so make more of them you know do that on a do that logo on a hat too I mean you got mileage in this thing I mean there, there's meat on the bone you can make a sue with us. You can indeed make a stew with this, Mike. Very well put. I could not agree more. And talking about a stew being cooked up, the special singles match, if if Shun Skywalker loses, he must leave Masquerade. Shun Skywalker versus Kota Minonora. Skywalker wins. He remains in Masquerade. The Triangle Gate team remains intact for now. However, he won via disqualification when he did the old Eddie Guerrero chair throw, but with his mask as referee, referee Takeyuki Yagi uh, fell to the ground after being mildly bumped and woke up to see Kota Minonora having Shun Skywalker's mask in his hand. What a fucking match. I, this, this masquerade story is so so good i mean as a broadcaster i should be able to have words to better describe how much i like this but i am sticking to the basics why overcomplicate a story that uh, on its own is so enriching and engaging this is i I don't even remember the last time drangate had a storyline that I was this invested in. It might be Shingo running through the old guys, and a lot of that was based off of in-ring storytelling, quite honestly. This is an angle that this promotion has been missing for years now. The emotional depths of this masquerade split is my favorite thing in wrestling. It's unbelievable, Mike. Yeah, and just like the way that Shun Skywalker was someone that on this show uh, 13 months ago, when when Masquerade is formed, I made the point that Masquerade will have issues, and the issue was that no one in the unit was a mic talker. However, Shun Skywalker having a psychological break and thinking everything he's doing is good and that Masquerade is fine has connected to the audience. Like this is more of a Kobe question, a Kobe statement, but the crowd was just like uh, was laughing like this guy's insane at him, and it worked very well. The work here, like Shun Skywalker, Kota Minonora that they did this really interesting story leading up to it that Kota Minora has Shun Skywalker's number. Like, throughout the match, like, yes, Shun would get in on some points, but Kota Minora went for the engranaje from the bell. Like, he was locking him down, like, saying, like, I want to get rid of this guy. I want to move on with my life. I'll get him in the engranaje. I know I can. And they worked the whole entire match kind of around the idea that Kota Minora just had this guy's number. Shun Skywalker was doing whatever he could to win this match, remain in Masquerade, keep Masquerade and the Triangle Gates intact, at least 
for one more show. And it was fascinating. It was riveting. And now you have a unit functionally that everyone else in the unit seems to hate Shun Skywalker for what he pulled on December 1st. <laughs> I don't think that's an exaggeration to say. Jason Lee was on commentator er, commentary earlier on in the show, and he was like, uh, yeah, I'm a guy in the middle, but he said it in a way that's like, yeah, he's in the middle, but he's really not. He's a really political not. Jason Lee. What a fascinating turn of events. This guy's like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> not, not for me. I don't know, Jay. I don't have an answer for you. No, uh, uh, just saying no comment if he would have said no comment that would have been tremendous it would have been like the i forgot what was like the inter the nba interview that was like ha 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 no answer oh yes i can't think of who that was either but yes uh, it was a really beautiful moment on commentary between jay and jason lee so we have all this happening you have shun skywalker who's now functionally a heel like there's nothing that he's done in the past month that can be construed as a babyface idea. In his mind, he's a babyface, and I think that's what makes it so compelling is that Shun Skywalker, he he, he makes the move because he's like, oh, I would have to save my mask. I'm, And he originally tries to lie and cover it up, you know, being a real dirtbag. And he's like, no, you know what? I apologize. I fucked up there. But I talked to Dragon Diet, and he's fine. And no one's buying it at all. No one's buying it at all. And he's like, I know it'll be great. We'll become Triangle Gate champions. That will get us back on track. Everything will be great for Masquerade. And his two partners hate him. Kodaman and Nora, right after winning the belts, was like, oh, we're champions. That's cool. Fuck you, dude. I want you out of the unit. I want a match. You know, just incredible stuff. The best storyline happening right now in wrestling is happening in Dragon Gate. And it's if you're missing out on it, like you could still get in and really like follow this. Like this is the stuff, like, as you said, like it's been years since we've really had this really rich storyline that is just so compelling. And, you know, this match, like it's hard to rate a match. That's really a prolonged angle. Like you said in a review, but the work there was great. This like the only demerit you can give is come on, Yagi. If you're going to take a bump, take a bump. Like we we know that you're old and retired, but like we, you, Mr. Nakagawa, he would have taken it like a champ. Mr. Nakagawa has taken unintentional bumps that have looked like absolute murder. <laughs> Nakagawa would have taken a pile driver to the floor if they asked him to. That man loves to get physical. That's that's really the one knock on this match is the move to set up the ref bump was pretty poorly executed, which is incredible given how well-timed and well-executed everything else was. I mean, the finish with the mask grip and Minora handing it and uh, Minora getting handed the mask and Yagi turning around, that was, that was perfect execution. That was as good as it gets. There was really just the one bummer with the ref bump and how that came to be. I was thinking about Skywalker earlier today and how we're five years into his career 25 years old maybe 26 at this point former open the dream gate champion and i was just trying to think of a historical comp for what we're seeing with him now in this moment because it might have passed some people by in 2019 but he really turned a corner in 2018 he worked with mochizuki in the all japan junior tag league and once he came back from that tournament it seemed like he had finally been able to match his confidence with his actual ability. And by 2019, he was having banger after banger after banger. The first part of that year, there's the Kaito Ishida match in Cork, and there's the Ben K match in Cork, and there's the Pac match at Champion Gate in Osaka. He's in the cage match that year, which was really good. There's that King of Gate 2019 match, Mochizuki versus Skywalker and Cork, and that was a top 10 match for me in 2019. I still think that is crazy underrated. And then he's got that KZ match at, at Kobe World that year, which I think really put that show on the path to Bing, as we talked about in the moment, one of the best Dragon Gate shows of all time. And then he went away, and we didn't see him for much of 2020, and then he's come back this year, and the general consensus among people that have seen his work is that he's one of the five best wrestlers in the world this year. We have a large sample size of what Skywalker can do as a wrestler, and I think anybody that has watched him for a prolonged amount of time knows how good he is, knows that he is in the upper echelon of wrestlers in the world. But what we're seeing now with this depth of character that he's showing is something that, quite frankly, 
I didn't think he had in him. I am so taken aback at how well he's performing right now because I just didn't think it was ever going to be something that he was capable of. And the only comp that I can really think of is that Shun Skywalker is really reminding me of late 2005, 2006 Brian Danielson right now. Of course, now Danielson was Ring of Honor World Champion when he was going through this character transformation. Skywalker is coming off of losing the Open the Dream Gate belt as he's going through this transformation. But, you know, you watch 2002 early Ring of Honor uh, Jersey All-Pro stuff, 2002 Danielson to 2005 Danielson, undeniably one of the best wrestlers in the world, but it started and stopped there. There was nothing to sink your teeth into outside of these great matches and much, you know, Danielson and Skywalker had that in common where their great matches were match of the year contenders. They were some of the best matches in the world, but there wasn't depth outside of the bell to bell work that they're doing. And in the same way that we saw Danielson become this amazing egocentric heel character in 2005 and 2006 with that title, we're now seeing Shun Skywalker do this character work that I just never pictured him being capable of doing. Like Mike repeated time after time at the start of this year, talking about Masquerade, was this is a unit who will be successful, but will run into that roadblock of not having talkers. And now Skywalker is doing these promo segments where I am uh, salivating, waiting for Jay to translate these on Twitter, because I know what Skywalker is saying is batshit crazy, quite frankly, and he's pulling it off perfectly. And it is remarkable to see this guy who was already one of the best wrestlers in the world now up his game and add an element that I did not think he'd be able to do. I, I am absolutely in love with him right now. And it's worth noting that, like, him going insane, one aspect of the match that we've not touched on yet was partway through, SB Kento and Hio brought out an RED color chair Threw it to Shun Skywalker when Yagi was distracted, and Shun Skywalker threw down the chair. So, in his mind, he's still a pure babyface. And I find that all really fascinating. And I remember Arn Anderson once saying, like, the truth about being a great heel is that you have to be believe in all your actions. You have, to be, you have to have some conviction there. And we're seeing that with Shun Skywalker. And it's something that I didn't necessarily think he was going to take this step forward, but. Now that he is, I'm happy he is. You know, like this is something that that the talking was always going to be the aspect where I was like, maybe he's not so good at it. I mean, Kazuma Sakamoto made a big point of that earlier this year. <laughs> but now we're seeing this aspect of it that I am now ready to see what can go with Shun Skywalker. I, I am I I feel like that we can kind of see the writing on the wall in a way, and I kind of want it to be subverted. But I am so intrigued by the prospect of heel psychological break, Shin Skywalker in 2022, and I think that that's easily like if we're gonna like list like our most anticipated things, that is number one with the bullets to see where this masquerade storyline goes to. Well, there's definitely a camp of people that think this ends with Menorah turning heel, which I I don't agree with, but I do think that's a fascinating angle to take. I, I think Shun is joining up with Hyo and possibly Yoshioka and possibly SB Kento. I think that's going to be the bulk of the new heel unit. And we're going to see Estrella go wherever. And we're going to see Daya join up with the rookie Doi. Then we're going to see Minora and Lee start their own thing. I, I mean, this is an angle that ultimately should impact the rest of the roster outside of maybe natural vibes, but the impact of masquerade exploding there should be shrapnel being uh, uh, touched on all parts of everybody going forward. This, oh my God, this angle is so good. This is really next level stuff. I, I, I think they have hit every beat perfectly so far. Yeah, if we thought that the RED, like the pride before the fall, was going to be like the the sign that things are going to happen, the uh, the spark to the fuse is what happens with Masquerade in a unit shakeup. Like, like there's no way it can't be, and I think you're dead on dead on about all of that uh before this match we had a trios match it was ultimo dragon jason lee and yosuke samaria versus Giki horiguchi konamawa ichikawa and sachi hoko boy uh yosuke samaria won with a blocked Ma la maestral cradle from konamawa ichikawa in 12 minutes or sorry 11 minutes and 23 seconds and 
this was your uh wreck match of the night like yeah, everyone's it's the day after christmas everyone wants to get out they want to move around a little bit and that's kind of what we had here what the most notable thing for me was throwing more reos at him jay having to call the match have a conversation with Punch Monaga, who they put on commentary with him. Punch Monaga speaks no English, so he's translating a lot. He's having a conversation with Tomonaga in Japanese and translating uh, Tomonaga's comments towards the match live while calling the match. I thought that that was just outstanding. I don't know if Jay believes he's a good commentator yet, but I will continue to emphasize that I, I think his standalone English calls are terrific. I, I think he is a legitimately great broadcaster at this point. The fact that he can now commentate a match in two languages at once cannot be understated. That is incredible. And, I, you know, the, the match is fine. I, in particular, love Kodamami Chikawa doing Jason Lee's Kung Fu chops in the corner with, with perfect execution, by the way. Ichikawa looked like he trained Kung Fu fighter at that point of the match. It was unbelievable to see. But when this match started, I thought they were going to run an angle with Tamanaga and Jay, given that for, for now it's plural, now years, Jay has repeatedly buried this man on commentary in the funniest ways possible. He always gets his shots in on Punch, and then Punch comes to the table. I'm thinking, oh my god, we've got Feud of the Year 2022 wrapped up, Jay versus Punch Tamanaga, and instead they form a great tag team. It was really wonderful to say. I think that's proof in the pudding that Tomonaka doesn't understand any English right there. <laughs> oh my god, he's so... <laughs> it's I, I always try to shout it out in my reviews that Jay's repeated burials of Punch, they're, it's not only funny because it's a reoccurring bit, the lines that this man will throw Punch's way are so ungodly brutal, and I, I think it is the greatest thing. Yeah, uh, that was the one thing from the match that really stood out to me, to be quite honest. <laughs> like, it it went 11 minutes, Case, on a nine-match show, and I was like, all right, I'm having a good time, but I'm done now. Yes, well, very much so. Uh, match four, tag team match, the Hashi brothers, Ishin and Ricky, uh, versus Natural Vibes, Sumi Akosuka and UT. Case, you thought this might be a chance that the Ahashi brothers would get their first direct fall. That didn't happen. So Sumi Yokosuka penned Riki with the Yokosuka cutter in 9 minutes and 27 seconds. And it wasn't for a lack of effort. The uh, the Ahashi brothers a few different times either had natural vibes guys in submissions or they got a few close near falls. And up until the actual finish when Yokosuka connected with the Yokosuka cutter on Riki Ahashi, I was still convinced that the Yahashi brothers were going to win this match towards the finishing stretch. Yokosuka hit a Jumbo Nokashi, no, Jumbo Nokashi on Ricky, and Ricky kicked out, and I, I rubbed my hands together. I said, here we go, Yahashi brothers, come back. These guys are going to get the win. And unfortunately, that did not happen, but I, I thought this was a very fun match in the middle of the show. Ishin might be the guy who has surprisingly good chemistry with a lot of people, in my opinion, because him and UT, like UT used his body as a jungle gym, and I really enjoyed that. Well, he's... There's just the right amount of bigger guys or hosses, for lack of a better term. There's just the right amount of hosses in this promotion, and Ishin is one of them, where they play a vital role in basing for some of the smaller guys, for adding power when power is needed so this roster doesn't get too pretty, but also still being able to stick out in their own unique way. In, in a way, Ishin could not have come into this promotion at a better time. And I think all of his offense really sticks out. He is clearly, like you said, someone who's developing chemistry with a number of guys on the roster. And I still feel that way about Ricky. I mean, I am salivating for a Ricky Hashi versus Naruki Doi match because every time those guys get in the ring, I, I think they show otherworldly chemistry with one another. So even in these tag team settings, the brothers are able to stick out as individuals and they are developing chemistry with their own unique palette of guys on the roster, which I think is a really interesting thing to watch develop. Yeah. And it's something that, you know, as you said, not a lot of hosses, but he has just the right amount of like rampaging bull in a China shop. I think that is going to be a whole lot of fun there. Uh, match three, uh, La Estrella versus Diamante. Diamante won in nine minutes and 47 seconds with the Vuelta finale. I thought that this was like a good comfort match for Estrella. Like we saw, at least I'm of the opinion that he, I think I'm, a, I'm alone on, on this Island that Estrella, you know, sometimes doesn't do things. I think are up to snuff for the roster, but you know, 
Sticking with Diamante, we know the chemistry there, and they had a perfectly fine singles match. The match started off so crazy that I, I really thought we were going to be in for kind of an all-time spot fest here, where they immediately go to the floor. Estrella hits a huge dive off of the stage onto Diamante, and I, it, it had... You know, the like the first match in Dragon Door history is that oh, it's, oh, I, it's Joe Leiter and somebody. You're going to do you know the match I'm talking about? Joe Leiter. No, I'm blanking. Sorry. Yeah. No, as I as I quickly scramble to open up the Dragon Door cage match page, it was Dragon. Do- uh, I'm sorry. It was Joe Leiter and Extreme Tiger Tigre Uno. That's who I thought it was. But I wasn't I wasn't locked in on that. You know, on the first Dragon Door show. They had this insane 11-minute spot fest that is sort of an all-timer. If you've never seen it, I can't recommend this match enough because they go out there and they just kill each other for 11 minutes. And it's the it's a, this mysterious promotion. It's the first match on this show. It's just, there's no other match that feels like it in the history because it was in such a unique context and time and place. And I, I was hoping just from the way this match started that Estrella and Diamante would almost be the answer to just recklessness and insane amounts of fun that that match provided. It actually ended up becoming, uh, for lack of a better term, a pretty economical match. Things, they told a story, things made sense, and the finish uh, came a little bit out of nowhere, but in the end, the right guy won in the right way. But boy, oh boy, did this match start off really hot. Yeah, that tope uh, con hello off the uh off the uh, stage was just insane and you know it, it it's something that i did see that diamante has gone back to mexico and you know it's kind of fitting that that would be his one of his final matches would be this here but i was just like all right he, you get the comfort match uh diamante he wasn't on uh kobe Sumo hall so this was his last match and you know kind of like a match that's kind of perfect for him to end his current tenure in dragon gate with hope he's back in 2022 and you know makes sense that he's with someone that he's proven that he has great chemistry with he's proven that he can ground and you know guide them through scenarios there and you know fitting way to end i would argue at least for this one run hopefully again he's back like i just saw that that he uh tweeted a photo like from the airport and it translated that i'm back in mexico but someone that i would say the most improved wrestler in the last decade of dragon gate this is unrelated, but since I'm thinking about Dragon Door, I believe I've told the story on this show before, but Mike, are you aware of the Magnum Tokyo BB Hulk run-in on the first Dragon Door show? Oh, yes. That's one of my favorite Ultimo Spite stories during yeah. that wilderness wandering phase. I'll tell the story quick just in case people haven't heard it. And I was just, I, I, it just, I was recently Googling something and this story popped up on, I think, Yahoo Japan, which... I just reminded me of it. And now we're talking about Dragon Door. So it's on my mind. Uh, the first Dragon Door show was supposed to be the Japanese debut of Mystico. And this is in the summer of 2005. This is right when he's taking off and becoming a really big deal. And Ultimo just happened to nab him for the show. And I don't know what match he was booked in. All I know is that Dragon Door was supposed to kick off in Cork and Hall. And Mystico's Japanese landing was supposed to be on this show. Mystico never gets on his flight. It's chaos. They don't know what they're going to do. Arguably, the star attraction of this promotion is not showing up to their debut show. And somehow, BB Hulk and Magnum Tokyo get word of this. And the story goes that they showed up to Cork and Hall with a bouquet of flowers and mockingly offered uh, to Ultimo Dragon to work the show for free because Mystico did not show up and they were told to buzz off and Dragon Door did not last much longer. To be clear, I don't think BB Hulk was the aggressor in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what you think there's bad blood between Magnum Tokyo and Ultimo Dragon? Why would you think that? <laughs> no, do I think one of the uh, biggest shit serves in the system's history you w- would have an issue with the principal? No, never, <laughs> never, case, never, not at all. No, uh, this, let me, this was BB Hulk along for the ride. This was him very in, much so. In, this was him at the back seat of a stolen car, not sure what's going on or where he's going. This is <laughs> through BB Hulk, no fault of his own. Look, BB Hulk found a guy that he was out drinking with. He found a guy, case you don't drink, so this this won't really land with you. On a wild night, he makes a friend and he's like all right come along with me a uh, young man will do this and suddenly he's like why am i burying a body and that's <laughs> yeah. what happened here <laughs> oh boy long live dragon door 
Long live Dragon Door. Uh, match two uh, was Puncho Managa and Ultra Soki from Ryukyu Dragon Pro Wrestling, the Dragon Gate partner promotion from Okinawa, versus Strong Machine J and Tarami Saver, also of Ryukyu Dragon. Tarami Saver won with a Firebird Splash that also landed on Punch Tomonaga's stomach yet again. And hey, uh, I remember now, like we were talking about who these guys were last week. I remember like, oh yeah, he's a former Mil Mongoose. I like Tarami Saver a lot. Uh, Ultra Soki, I mean, he's a big guy. Like I didn't, I don't think he's very good to be quite honest. But uh, hey, Punch, uh, you're on a tag team of someone of your equal skill level. You might be most excited in 2022 about this masquerade storyline going forward. I am most excited to see if Punch Tamanaga continues to take 450 splashes to the ribcage or not. It's my favorite story in wrestling. It looks so brutal, and I feel so bad for him, but it couldn't happen to a funnier man. Hey, I mean, what, now what do you see someone doing like a double, a 450 double stomp? Like, that's kind of what happened with the Jupiter 450, but I mean, I know that, I forgot who it was who did like the, who who did like the, the flipping double stomp finish, or Loki needs to come in and stomp his stomach. Bring in Loki. Oh, Case Low Produce Show? Loki versus Punch Tamanaga is opening the show. Yeah, yeah, he's just going to outright just, he's going to put him down with a kick, he's going to hit the Warrior Way double stomp, and that's it. I, it should be noted Jason Lee was on commentary for this match. I thought Jason Lee, uh, with his limited English, was a very fun color commentary man. And uh, to circle back from earlier talking about Jay bearing Punch Tamanaga, at one point Jay did say, and I quote, three masked men and a bald guy in this match. Maybe Punch should consider a mask, which is so mean. It's unbelievable. The burial. I, I I don't think that's even the meanest thing Jay said. I thought that the the line about, oh, he, he has a headband like LeBron uh, hiding his hairline, which got a laugh from Jason Lee that I thought was, that was cold. I mean, the, 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 that's a reference to Bridges Cultures right there. I keep, I, we didn't talk about it on the show, but there's that video on the Drangate Network of, I think it's UT and KZ in a free throw challenge uh, from one of the Hokkaido shows. I look, I know Masquerade has bigger fish to fry right now, but I need to see Jason Lee hoop because if I if I believe if, if my thoughts are correct, Jason Lee is the best basketball player on this roster. And I would love to see him cross over some dorks on the on, on Drangate. So at some point, Jason Lee playing basketball needs to be on the Drangate network. Masquerade versus ne- uh I don't want natural vibes to get crossed up. Uh, high end. I, I want to see him cross up. I, I I mean, Dragon Kid's all about body control and break dancing. Let's see what happens when uh, Jason Lee does a crossover and breaks DK's ankles. You know, Dragon Kid has to be horrible to play one on one against. I bet his defense is next level. Oh, he's just going to be a pest. Yeah, you know? God, I mean, that's got to suck. Elbow in your back, and then at the right time turning his heel and swatting at the ball. You know, I mean, he's probably not going to get his hand up for many blocks, but in order to get to that shot, you're going to go through 24, 30 seconds of hell. Fascinating. All right. And the opener, this match is available on YouTube in both English and Japanese. I think you should go out, go and seek it out. It's another gut check as the veterans face off against the future class of 2021 Masaki Mochizuki, Don Fuji, Yazushi Kanda, and Kagatora versus Shoya Sato, Takuma Fujiwara, Ryu Fuda, and Takumi Hayakawa. It was Fuji nearly breaking Hayakawa's back with a Hime in 10 minutes and 53 seconds. I thought that this was better than their Korkin match. I love this. I went four stars on it flat. I referenced it last week. The Mochizuki and Fuji versus Ishida and Yamamura match from Final Gate 2016. I talked about the finish, which was Fuji putting, I believe it was Yamamura in the Boston Crab and Mochizuki axe kicking him in the back of the head while he was in this crab. And sure enough, that is the finish they do in this match with Hayakawa being the victim this time around. What a brilliant start to the show. What a fun match, given that Jay was on commentary with Genki Horiguchi, who I, I honestly would love to hear more of him on color commentary. One, because Horiguchi doesn't understand 
the microphones amplify your voice. So Horiguchi was screaming at the top of his lungs during everything he said, which I thought was super entertaining. Yes. <laughs> Just, I believe it was Joe Lanza who said earlier today, he was like a dad talking on a cell phone. Like he didn't understand that there was amplification uh, involved in this process, but also because Horiguchi had fascinating insight in this match. Him, Jay asked who he thought was the most impressive member of the future class. And, Horiguchi mentioned that he thought it was Fujiwara, which, look, I, I am so high on Fujiwara right now. It's unbelievable. We'll talk about that more in just a minute when we get to that Kobe show on the 28th. But just it, this this opener was everything you would want it to be. It's on YouTube. Go watch it if you haven't seen it. Yeah, I will at least try to put the English version in the show notes. It just was awesome here. Uh, it, it's just something that like everyone got to have their moment Hayakawa's Casadora complete shot is really cool like I I I'm lower on Hayakawa than most but being able to use his size as an advantage be like oh I can make this move into a a Casadora where for most people to turn into an arm drag or like a headlock takeover but it's like no I I'm just going to climb up your body mid Casadora I thought that was really tight and then Kakatora landed on his head after the after one of the Pachi punches, and I was, you know, which one I'm talking about too. <laughs> that was just, oh, that was brutal. That there's was there's brutal. a moment in this match where you know it, it's a it's an especially violent match. It's the type of result that you would expect when you see the veterans against the rookies like this. But you know, there's a spot in Japanese wrestling where a guy will come in the ring. And he'll run past the other guy in the ring, his opponent, and he'll run towards the apron and knock the guys off the apron. And we've seen Don Fuji in particular do this a million times, but I have never seen him do what he did quite as violently as he did to Hayakawa, where Fuji just runs in the ring and cold cocks this man. He punched him square in the face. And even in the context in the scale of Don Fuji beating up young boys, this was one of the most violent things I've ever seen, and I loved every second of it. It was so sick. It, it, this is really worth going out of your way for, and it's up for free. You know, they put this match on first for a reason. Go in there. If you just listen to the show, don't really follow along with the promotions. I know there are some folks who do, and I get it. This match, it's only 10 minutes long, and it's worth every second of it. it is worth it and you can hear what why case and i always freak out about these gut check matches because they are just an absolute blast uh do you have any more thoughts on final cape before we get into the events of kobe sambo hall it's a really fun show i i think you know there's there's definitely some stuff you can skip you can skip the punch match i don't necessarily know if estrella versus diamante was a good match i don't know if it's essential viewing you can skip the ichikawa match that six man it was fun but it did go 11 minutes and this was a pretty long show but menorah versus skywalker the nine man tag uh the twin gate match just for the finish and that main event those are essential viewing matches if you have any desire to follow this promotion those are matches to go out of your way to watch immediately uh, one question that I have for you, Case, considering how we felt about the uh, big shows this year, do you think this was a return to form? Because I kind of felt like it was. I-, I can't say yes, only because of the way the Twin Gate match played out, where I spent 14 minutes wondering if the brightest prospect in wrestling had a serious knee injury. And that is something that has plagued these big shows all year with Kakuta dead or alive, with the fact that Kobe World and Speed Star Final were built around a man who had had two series of injuries to continue wrestling, and for the fact that Skywalker uh, had the injury the day before Dangerous Gate, and even Yamato versus BB Hulk was kind of a oh I wonder if BB Hulk's body can survive this match. We unfortunately had to deal with another really intense moment of I hope this guy is okay at Final Gate, but other than that, yes, it was a return to form. Yeah, maybe we'll get a big show in 2022. Actually, that's my big hope. It's not it's not seeing where this masquerade thing is going. It's hoping that we can get through a big show without an injury fear. That would be It would be nice. really nice if that could happen. So, before we get into Kobe Sambo Hall, uh this is already a pretty long episode, but we got to talk about this. Uh there was one event at Kobe Sambo Hall that kind of even with the matches that happened is worth kind of pulling out and discussing first we get into the show. After the third match of the show uh 
general manager of Rio Saito because of other things. Actually, that might, this might have been a little bit later than that because he came out a couple times. But general, general manager Rio Saito came out, uh, called out someone, and that person announced their impending retirement. And that person is Kness. Kness will be retiring after over 25 years of wrestling on April 7th, 2022. Notable that will be Dragon Gate's first Corkin with a full capacity since COVID. And yeah, was, I just felt like we probably should take a couple minutes to talk about Kness's impending retirement and what all that means. Yeah, I can I can assure the listeners we're gonna do more Kness content as his retirement gets closer. It's it's a sad situation to see just because for the people that like Kness, it seems like if you're a fan of his, if you identify with him as a wrestler, that means he is one of your favorite wrestlers. And he just had that weird emotional pull onto certain people. He's one of the most unique wrestlers we've ever seen. He has single-handedly some of the most important matches in the history of the Dragon system. And it's unfortunate that he's slowed down as much as he has in recent years because he was someone who through 2019 would get a big title match every once in a while. And I always looked forward to it just because I knew those matches were going to look different than anything else. Uh, This afternoon I was watching uh, Kness in one of his first matches in that gimmick versus Yoshino. Obviously they have a very famous match at Kobe world 2003. And then another very famous match at Kobe world 2013. But I was watching their match from T2P in December of 2002 And in that environment with that hot crowd, with the T2P guys by that point, the Italian connection, really feeling like larger than life superstars is such a unique atmosphere. And it is one that Kness really seemed to feed off of. He looks like a million bucks in that match. That is a chaotic sprint, a 10 minute match with about a million things going on in it, but is a really fun match nonetheless. And I think he's one of those guys, you know, Obviously, you have Dragon Kid versus Darkness Dragon, which you can point to as the high point of his career. And then your mileage may vary depending on what your favorite Kineska match is. But he is someone that, you know, if you were to go through year by year by year, I think you would find a lot of hidden gem under the radar Kines matches along the way, because this is someone who was not on the very first Torimon show, but joined the promotion on the very first tour in early February of 1999. So he is an OG that will be sorely missed as uh, he retires in April. Yeah, I mean, for me, and as you said, we'll we'll certainly have a deeper talk and a retrospective on Kness's career before he retires. For me, he's a part of my favorite match in Dragon Gate system history. He's a part of that Darkness Dragon versus Dragon Kid match at Absolutamente. And he is someone that he was a he is a different style of wrestler, and I think you really hit the nail on the head for like the people who are uh, Kness fans. They ride or die with him, and for good reason. He just had a different style to it. He was kind of like the cerebral wrestler, like like the idea that like he had the counter to the Bible or the Cristo. He had the soul not not noches al as a counter to the soul naciente, and he was really really cool. And I mean, he was. He even had like important moments even after like like the big story. I don't think we really t- discussed this is he is someone that pretty uh, pretty early on like post Darkness Dragon started to accumulate injuries, particularly had a pretty bad shoulder and just was someone that never could get going for a longer than like a year and a half period of time after that. Like he did have his run into Fixer, but then he got hurt and kind of bowed out from there. Did. Final M2K did Windows and then came back really with uh, Team Veteran into um, Mad Blanky. He was one of the zombie Mad Blanky members, zombie veterans who joined Mad Blanky and then was a the focal point of the Mad Blanky versus Jimmy's Loser Must His Band match. And then he had a, another run with uh, the Jimmy's into its uh, conclusion and that kind of really was it for a main roster member. This was someone that we, when I talk about, like just start anticipating over the next decade, these guys to kind of start uh, phasing out, starting to retire. Obviously we've seen Rio Saito start to phase it a little bit. Uh, sadly, uh, Kness is someone that always slips my mind because of his uh, prolonged stints on the IL. 
be quite honest, but it was something that it was always kind of very clear that uh, a continued full-time career wasn't necessarily in the cards for him after a certain point. And it's still just like an absolute bummer because he's one of those guys that, I mean, member of M2K, a part of my favorite match in Dragon System history and kind of a sign of the generation change. So we'll talk more about this as we get closer to April, but it was something that we both felt like we should cover before we got into today's Kobo Assemble Hall show. Yeah, uh, final thoughts on Kness for now. And again, this is something we'll circle back to as as we get closer to his actual retirement. An integral part of Torimon. You cannot tell the story of 1999 through 2004 without him and his multiple characters. He gets a, a pretty bad shoulder injury, or maybe it was a, even a neck injury in 2005. And he's really not the same after that, because one of the first things I did when COVID first hit, and, you know, it was that, that wonderful period of like March and April of 2020, where we were all terrified, but we also just had all this time on our hands because everything stopped. And one of the first things I did was I, I went back and I watched Dragon Gate in 2005 in order from January through December. And you really get a, a, a special look at to just how good Kness was during that year. And he gets hurt towards the end of 2005 and is never really the same after that. And he certainly has high points along the way as his career continued, but that injury seemed to take a lot out of him. Uh, Mike has talked at length before about Dragon Kid versus Darkness Dragon. For me, the defining Kness moment is always going to be Dangerous Gate 2015. And this is on the network, the Jimmy's versus Mad Blanky Despance match. And Kness turning his back on Mad Blanky, saving Susumi Yokosuka, and the shriek of the audience in Tokyo when he turns on Mad Blanky and helps the Jimmies out. It is one of uh, the the best pops I have ever heard in wrestling. It is a special moment. It will send chills down your spine if you haven't seen it or if you just haven't seen it in a very long time. So I would recommend that. And the other thing I'll say about uh, Kness, my final point, he is a really good follow on Twitter. I don't know, I would assume not, just given his physical state. I don't think he has any sort of uh, role as a trainer or a coach in this promotion. But if you follow Kness and and with the lovely help of Twitter Translate, he is someone who I, I read all of his tweets because he is so invested in the future of Dragon Gate, and so high on this current rookie class, he put over that opening match from Final Gate we were just talking about. He he gets so excited when these young guys do well, and he's always tweeting about it. And I think that's a really fun thing to see. He's a guy that clearly has his pulse or his finger on the pulse of this promotion, and I love seeing that. I I love wrestlers that love wrestling, and Kness is one of those guys. Absolutely, and we'll as we've mentioned a couple times, we'll, we'll have a lot more. Kness coverage as we draw closer to April 7th. Uh, the last show of 2021 was their traditional fan. It used to be a fan appreciation show. They've kind of dropped that, but it was the uh, the final show in the friendly confines and home base, Kobe Sumbo Hall. It was a full house and super no vacancy of 380. It was today, so doing my bad math in my head, that should have it up on the network until the 4th. I managed to case at like 5.30 today. I was like, Mike, can we talk about this? And I was like, all right, I'll get through what I can get through. And I managed to pretty much watch the whole show with the exception of one match. And just like top to bottom, this was a fun show to end the year on, I would say. Uh, I was wondering, because I was on the road all day today. I didn't know if I was going to have time to watch this show and I am so glad I did before we recorded. And I am so glad that you were able to squeeze it in as well, because I was looking over my notes and I was looking over prior Kobe Sambo Hall shows this year. And I can say this show was my favorite Kobe Sambo Hall show of the year. I loved this card. Yeah. And it started off with what I thought was the match of the night. It was a high end versus it was high end and affiliated versus natural vibes. It was high-end team of Yamato and Keisuke Takuda teaming with Takuma Fujiwara versus the Natural Vibes team of, of KZ, Big Boss, Shimizu, and Funky Jackie Kamei. Shimizu did the Big Boss press on Fujiwara. And let's throw some uh, l- let's throw some credit to who the person I would say is the front-runner of the future class. If we were still doing the MVP of the week, 
yeah, he probably would not be MVP of the week, but Takuma Fujiwara has made that step forward. He might be the guy case. Look, he is the guy we talked about least after his debut, and that that son of a bitch from Ireland, Alan Forrell, he he scoped this out immediately. He said people are talking about Fuda, people are talking about Sato, Hayakawa has his fans, but Fujiwara is the guy, and I hate him because he's right. Fujiwara had such an unspectacular debut. Not that it was bad. I said that at the time. It was just a very pedestrian, very simple match with Kagatora. It was hard to get a read on what type of wrestler he could be going forward. And we are now learning a month and a half into his career that Takuma Fujiwara can do whatever he wants and that he is going to be the most versatile guy of this class. He is he is improving leaps and bounds every single time we see him. He's starting to add new moves into his repertoire, the slingshot double stomp. He busted out some O'Connor roll flash pins in this match that were ridiculous. This guy is something special and he's only 19 years old. He's the most intriguing guy just because I, I, I need to see what he looks like bulked up because he seems pretty tall. He's pretty lanky right now. This could be, if he adds muscle and his body fills out the right way, which is always a gamble. We see that a lot, especially, you know, NBA guys get drafted at 19. We think their body's going to go one way. It goes another. If Fujiwara fills out the right way, this is a heavyweight contender for the future. And this could be the guy in this future class. Yeah, we've talked about before that Sato, because of his age, probably has the leg up of being the first one elevated. No, Fujiwara should be... The, if Kota Minura, as he should be, is the first draft pick to Naruki Doi's International House of Boys, Takuma Fujiwara should be number two. Like, just get behind him right now. Uh, yeah, we have to see how he pans out. Case, how does it feel like now that you really have someone on the roster who is a couple of years younger than you, and you have to be reminded each time you talk about that this guy is a couple of years younger than you? It's crazy. I mean, I but I, I go through that with SB Kento because, you know, I was... I was home at my parents' house over Christmas, and there's nothing my parents love more than making fun of me when they ask, you know, what I've got going on the next day or something. And my answer on December 25th of what do you have going on tomorrow is, ah, big show in Fukuoka. I'm going to wake up at three in the morning and watch it. They, I mean, this has been going on for years now, and they, they just love making fun of me for it. But the next morning, you know, I watch Final Gate. I go into the kitchen and get some breakfast and my dad's, you know, he doesn't know anything about wrestling. He doesn't like wrestling. He doesn't, he doesn't care, but he always asks, you know, Hey, how was the wrestling? And I go, ah, you know, there's this 21 year old. I really like, I think he blew out his knee and it, it, he was like 21. That's younger than you. I was like, I know what this kid is. Th- he's so good. And now we've got to deal with a 19 year old who is as bright of a prospect. It pains me, Mike, I'm getting old at 22 years old. Buddy, I'm just happy that now you're getting it thrown back into your face. You know, I know it, being young has always been my thing. I got to get a new gimmick soon. These Dragon Gate guys, they're debuting at 19, 20 years old, and it's it's throwing me off a little bit. Yeah, but at least with Takuma Fujiwara, we'll get to see him progress, and I think that's going to be really super exciting. Uh, I had a, a note here that I wanted to bring up with you. We We've talked at length about Diamante's. Uh, claim to be back-to-back most improved wrestlers. Jackie Funky Kame, would he be number two of the year? That's a good question, Mike. I. It's interesting. You know, it's kind of what you value in a most improved because I thought Kame was really good last year. And although he's progress in the second half of this year uh, arguably better than I would have expected him being this good is not surprising Diamante taking the steps he's taken to be as good as he is now is stunning given how you know how he was when he first walked into this promotion I don't consider Kamei for that award because he debuted and was good he got better and now he's getting even better and that's just the the mindset of I would rather see a guy go from bad to good than good to very good. If that makes sense. No, that's, 
that's entirely fair. Look, like, I mean, you have to have some sort of philosophy behind that kind of an award. So I see your justification there. I think that that's, I think you're completely entitled to have that here. Uh, the, the other last note about this opener, I went four flat on this, by the way, case. I thoroughly love this match. Uh, Yamato kind of got back the joy of life in this opener, especially, you know, getting a chance to, you know, uh, try try to shit talk uh, KZ and Shimizu. Like, you could tell that he was actually, you know, feeling it once again. Yeah, this was a, a very fun match. I went three and three quarters on it. Uh, it's interesting, you know, like Yamato and KZ opened this match up, and I just, for, for his good as a lot of guys were on this card you watch Yamato and KZ go at it and you go oh those are two of the best wrestlers in the world like their chemistry even in this opening six man in a small venue that is next level chemistry and still for as good as that was this opening match was the Hayakawa or I'm sorry the Fujiwara and the Kamei show those two stole the show in this opener yeah no I think you're entire I, I think you're entirely right about that uh, this would also be up on YouTube so check it out as well uh, the next match case, I'm going to throw it to you to take this because this was the match I skipped. This was the six-man tag. Uh, High-end, Dragon Kid, Kakatora, Binke versus Ultimo, Naruki Doi, and Takashi Yoshida. The fall was Yoshida with the Pineapple Bomber on Kakatora. Completely skippable. You missed nothing. All right. There we go. Match three. The newly crowned Open the Dreamgate champion, Kai, versus Takumi Hayakawa. And guess what? If you were to ask me who would be the first member of the future class to get a direct fall, it would not be this result. Kai hit the medio impact on Takumi Hayakawa after basically just, just big brothering him for two minutes, pulled him over himself, took the three count, immediately celebrated it like the shit heel he was. It brought out Ryo Saito. Ryo Saito said, what the fuck's your problem? You're the Dreamgate <laughs> champion. Carry That's yourself quote, as by champion. The way. <laughs> that, that is a quote. That is a quote. You're a Dreamgate champion. You have to carry this way. It's like, yes, I am the Dreamgate champion. Why do you give me this as my match? Why do you give it to me against the smallest guy on the roster? I deserve someone bigger, more impressive. Uh, Takashi Yoshida took that as, hey, I should go out there and do this. That was not who Ryo Saito had in mind. The uh, future security force came out, helped out Hayakawa, made sure that Yoshida did not get into the ring. And that was it for Kai of the Night. Uh, what a tremendous dickhead. So this segment, I'm going to compliment Sandwich it. The idea of it was awesome. Kai was the perfect guy for it. Hayakawa was the perfect guy for it. I love that two days after winning the Dreamgate belt, this is what Kai is doing. It gave him a chance to show off his brutality, and it gave him a chance to show off how good of a character he can be. This finish is my least favorite finish in wrestling, and I have a history of complaining about this. If you go back to the Dreamgate USA Rewind and Rewatch series, Dreamgate USA United Finale, the show, which I thought was one of the worst in Drangit USA history, had the worst match in Drangit USA history on it. It was John Moxley versus Homicide. And they had this horrible, horrible no DQ match. Homicide at his worst. Moxley bringing out his worst tendencies in this match. And it ends up with the finish being Homicide beating John Moxley senseless and then him draping Moxley's arm over him and Moxley winning the match because the logic was Homicide didn't want to beat him. He just wanted to beat him up. And I think that's really stupid. I think you should always try to beat your opponent. And I would be losing my mind in a positive way, going nuts, raving over how much I love this if Kai would have just pinned him because the idea was great. The beatdown was great. The structure of this match was awesome. I hated the finish though. Yeah, no, I mean, you're nothing if not consistent, you know. It's just this, I, now goes, this goes down in the history books as Hayakawa's first win, and it shouldn't. It's, it, it, it's ridiculous. If, if it was his second win, I would have less of an issue with it. But I just, I don't, I don't like this at all. You should never sacrifice a victory if you don't have to. That's just a, a blanket logic in wrestling that I don't like. I don't like when people do that. No, you're entirely justified with that. Uh, it was something that, I mean, that's kind of an asterisk in Hayakawa's uh, stat sheet going forward. Uh, match four, the Royal Sambo. 
uh, Susumi Yokosuka, Ginki Horiguchi, UT, Super Sisa, Konamawa Chikawa, Sachioko Boy, Problem Dragon, Punch Tomonaga, Yosuke San Maria, SB Kento were the participants. SB Kento was the last entrant. He hung out in the outside. It was uh, it was a strong machine. No, it wasn't strong machine. It was uh, UT on the outside and was just. I forgot who was the other person in this case. I'm. It sorry. was strong machine J. It was strong machine J. So I was I was right. So strong machine J is not listed on the on the Facebook page, but they uh, strong machine J got eliminated from the apron. UT was kind of going like, all right, okay. And then uh, SB Kento th- knocked him off the apron, won the match, and immediately limped back to the back. This match started with UT and Super Shisa doing cool grappling, and it ended in an SBK victory. To me, this is the perfect battle royal. After this, so after match three before intermission was, or match four, this was really match three when you consider the uh, Kai match. Uh, we had the Kness retirement announcement. Semi main event. We had another gut check. It was the Hashi brothers were thrown in the mix for the first time with Soya Sato and Ryofuda versus Misaki Mochizuki, Don Fuji, Yazushi Kanda, and Shuji Kondo. Kondo got the win on Fuda with a devastating King Kong Lariat. And they lit off this match with Don Fuji with a chair from at least 25 feet out, pegging Sato with a chair, throwing it into the ring. And that's when you know, let's go. So I'm really glad you brought this up because I saw Fuji throw the chair and then I was watching the footage and I thought, did that chair hit Sato? Like, I understand this is one of the most decorated judoka to ever enter the professional wrestling industry, but my man's depth perception must be really fucked up if he couldn't move out of the way of this chair. A center fielder, he is not. Hey, when you get older, things start to go. You know, my vision ain't what it was in my mer- in my early twenties. <laughs> this wasn't a Nolan Ryan fastball. This was a half court shot from Don Fuji, where he lobs this chair up into the lights. <laughs> and look, to his credit, it's one hell of a throw by Fuji. The accuracy of throwing a folded out chair should not be <laughs> should not be lost. Okay, one hell of a throw. But Shoya Sato move to the side do one something step. <laughs> you can't one step to the side there as a chair is hurled your way by a psychopath come on man <laughs> do better <laughs> you, you know if, if we had a soundboard here and we we're doing drops this is where you would have uh jim garrison from jfk going back into the left <laughs> back into the left back into the left because he just like domed him with it it, it rocked uh there's something about this match that I like that we're seeing out of this, and I want to see if you felt the same way, Case. I like the, th- the idea that the future class, they're not winning. Like, that's not the case. But they're starting to figure out the veterans a little bit, and they showed that in this match. And they, they were a little bit more on offense a little bit. Maybe it's the fact that the Ahashis have been around a little bit longer, and that helps them out with that. But I like the idea that, the that yeah, the future class, they're going to lose this match, but they put up a little bit more of a fight. Let it be known, Mike, December 28th, 2021, four members of the future class, Ricky and Ishinihashi, Ryu Fuda, and Shoya Sato, are now in the notebook. I went four stars with this match. It's the first time I have gone four stars on a match featuring any of these guys. And I completely agree with what you said. We are announcing a natural evolution uh, match-to-match psychology between these guys, and I am all about it. I am in love with these guys right now. And, and, and I'll add this. I was three and three quarters, so, you know, you, we flip-flopped on the opener in the semi-main here. Let me say something about this. Ryu Fuda, Shuji Kondo, they got a thing going on, and I like it a lot. I think Fuda might actually have better chemistry with Shuji Kondo than he does with Masaki Mochizuki. That's that's the exact correct take. Is it, obviously Fuda and Mochizuki. That's the natural pairing. Those guys should have, uh, you know, Fuda. It made sense for him to debut against Mochizuki. Those two should be paired at the hip because it's such an obvious connection. But the more we can sprinkle in Kondo into Fuda's life, it's going to make his life much harder. Food is going to be much more sore because of it, because he does get thrown around like nothing, despite being a pretty big, pretty muscular guy. Kondo throws him around like nothing, but their chemistry, that's that's exactly it, is those guys really put together 
a marvelous finishing stretch that was preceded by Ricky Hashi and Mochizuki trading strikes and Mochizuki open hand palm striking, slapping to the face, slapping the shit out of Ricky Ihashi, and then hitting him with a twister. I thought surely that would be the finish. It wasn't. Fuda broke up the pin, and then we got that hot finishing stretch between Fuda and Kondo. Kondo. This starts a a little slower than some of their matches have, but that finishing stretch was classic Dragon Gate action. It's really cool to see these kids a month into their career able to hang with these veterans in what you would expect from a seasoned roster member at this point. This was a big step forward for all of these guys. Four stars, you can put it on the board. Yeah, uh, it, it's something where, I mean, it's going to take a second to regain your equilibrium when you get hit in the head by by Don Fucci throwing a chair case. Like, it's understandable <laughs> why things took a little bit. Take a, take a step to the left, my man, and you're good. <laughs> I, I'm so glad you I like I didn't want to ask hey did that chair that Don Fuji th- that, that he threw did that hit Shoyasato I'm yes. so glad you brought that up because I I in my mind I was like this is a this is an almost Olympic level athlete like this man is clearly one of the greatest athletes in all of pro wrestling right now just given his prior credentials there's no way he let this chair hit him. That's just not something that would happen, but apparently it is. Gosh, it's so good. And something worth noting, the crowd wasn't as hot as uh, as Sora Fujikawa's uh, claim over that, but the crowd's game behind them. The crowd is game behind the future class. It's nice to see. It's nice to hear, and it's something that's going to be really cool to see over 2022 to see what the crowd is going to, who the crowd's going to gravitate to. I feel like the crowd... Probably is going to gravitate towards Fujiwara, but they like all these boys. I mean, the future class, the largest class in the Dragon system since the Torimon classes. Looks like we call it, got a whole bunch of winners here. Yeah, this is still very much phase one of their, of their careers, and we always talk about how, in recent memory, phase one has been a huge success for most of their trainees it's getting over that sophomore slump, whatever the next step is once they graduate from that that bottom of the barrel young boy status, where we've seen some guys trip up and some guys are able to get over the hump, other guys aren't. But for phase one, this first portion of their career, they're doing everything right so far. The main event of the final show of Dragon Gates 2021, they went back to the storyline of 2021, really. It was R.E.D. versus Masquerade. Eita, B.B. Hulk, Kaito Ishida, and Hio versus Shun Skywalker, Kota Minora, Jason Lee, and La Estrella. Minora got the win on Eita after Eita was accidentally attacked by Hio with the box lid. This was preceded by Eita ducking out of the way of the powder attack. Hio and Eita, they are still not on the same page. And we went out on the note that kind of really uh, summed up Dragon Gates 2021. We got to see these two teams at it one last time. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add in terms of the bell to bell in this match. I gave it four stars, and I love from a poetic sense that the year closed with this match because when we look back on 2021, a few years from now, we're going to think about the mask versus mask match. We're going to think about Masato Yoshino retiring. And although probably everybody is going to have a different favorite RED versus Masquerade match. I think history is going to be very kind to this year when it comes to the work that these two units did. I love that we closed the year with these eight guys in the ring. The finish was terrific. The post-match, which Mike can t- which Mike can talk about in just a second, was absolutely nuts. I- I'm just very satisfied that as the book closes on 2021, this was the final thing on the final page. Yeah, the, th- the only other thing I'll add in about the match itself, like, R.E.D. was excellent in this. Like, they were really great at playing their role. But, again, this was Masquerade doing the character work here that I felt like was truly phenomenal. Jason Lee, like, just emoting and showing his uh, frustration was phenomenal here. And then Shun Skywalker, as we've talked about for almost the last two hours, just being an absolute psychopath has been really good. Like, there was the moment where we were starting to get Jason and... Kota doing their tag team offense. Shoot Skywalker was like, oh, I'm going to hop in here. And Kota Minora just went, oh, fuck. Okay. <laughs> and just left the ring. That I thought was just chef's kiss. I thought that was excellent. So let's talk about that post-match case. The final moments of Dragon Gates 2021. 
It was Masquerade standing tall. They were doing the farewell speech. I'm going to read these from uh, Jay's Twitter, GG underscore J. If you aren't following him, then why aren't you? Go follow him. Uh, the Shun Skywalker uh, was starting to address the crowd. Kota Minora grabbed a microphone and Kota said, was basically saying, fuck you. This is, how are you really going to go out on this note? We are not happy. We're not united for front. Shun Skywalker collects all the microphones because Kota Minora kept on pulling microphones from uh, Ring and Astro Kikuchi during this. So Shun Skywalker had three microphones that he cut the majority of this promo into. Uh, Kota Minora said that everything is his fault, and he told Dragon Dai to get in touch. Shun Skywalker says he can hear Dai's voice, and he says he'll be back as a member of Masquerade soon. As soon as he started doing this, this was when the remainder of Masquerade, even La Estrella, who you can't really tell because he had a, a closed face mask on this show, they all bailed. They all were disgusted with it. And then Shun gave a super baby face closing speech concluding with him screaming from the top of the turnbuckle into three microphones doing a backflip and that was it for dragon gates 2021 with the absolute madman speaking into three microphones alone in the ring i have the picture up on my twitter at underscore in your case it is photos from and this is somebody whose name i will butcher and i do apologize in advance it is at isita marie who is someone who I, I believe is living in Japan right now. That she's had great photos from all of these Dragon Gate live events recently. She has two that she posted earlier today. I put them up on my Twitter as well of Shun Skywalker standing in the middle of the ring with three microphones. And then another picture of Shun Skywalker holding all three Open the Triangle Gate championships. And that is the perfect way to close this year. And I think that is the perfect way to close the showcase. Do you have anything else you want to add before we get out of here? I, I do not. This was a, a very fun two hours. I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah, and we will have some fun stuff going for y'all in the feed as Dragon Gate takes its winter break. Uh, they'll be back on January 8th in Kyoto. And in case you know what they say about Kyoto. What's that, Mike? You never know what will happen in Kyoto. Damn straight. So that's going to do it. You can follow us at Open Voice Gate. Case, as he mentioned, is at underscore in your case. And I'm at Fujiheya. Thanks for listening to Open the Voice Gate. We'll catch we'll catch you next time as we talk more about Dragon Gate and their year of 2021. Take care.